So now we're going to talk to Ralph Boyd Jr. Uh, Ralph Boyd Jr. is the new uh, uh, president and CEO of So Others Might Eat, which is also known as SUM. Uh, he has a very interesting background, graduate of, of Haverford and Harvard Law School. He was a partner in a Boston law firm, an excellent Boston law firm, uh, Goodwin, Procter & Hoare. But he got out of that to become assistant attorney general for civil rights under the George W. Bush administration. And certainly a number of things in the nonprofit area, including being the chair and CEO of the Freddie Mac Foundation. And uh, more recently, he's been a senior fellow at the Urban Law in, at the Urban Land Institute. And uh, he's uh, also somebody who has run the American Red Cross in the Massachusetts region as a CEO. So very eclectic background. But now he's committed to uh, running so others might eat. So Ralph, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you, David. Good morning to you and uh, to everyone who's joining the podcast. So for those who don't know what some uh, is, so others might eat, tell us what it actually is and when it was started. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So some is an interfaith community-based human services organization, David, that supports the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable residents in the national capital uh, city. Um, and we provide for them uh, a range, a comprehensive range of human services from emergency services to medical, dental, and mental health services, substance abuse treatment. We run dining facilities, food pantries. We have job training programs, a full panoply of social services, and then very significantly affordable housing with supportive wraparound services. And the people that we serve through our mission, uh, David, are amongst the most vulnerable. The folks who are uh, experiencing poverty and homelessness, who are at risk of poverty and homelessness. And to give you a metric that gives you some sense of who our residents and clients are, if you look at area, area mean income, these are folks who, whose households have anywhere from zero to 30% of area mean income. So this is the folks who are most at risk, most vulnerable, and quite frankly, our mission um, that we deploy through those range of services that I described is really intended to move people, as I like to say, from a place of insufficiency to sufficiency, and ultimately to prosperity, both material, emotional, and spiritual as well. So the idea is to take a very vulnerable population, empower them uh, so that they get not only to be self-sufficient, but, but prosperous in all the ways all of us care, uh, care to be and aspire to be. So who started SUM? So SUM started and was started in 1970 uh, by a Catholic priest, Father Horace McKenna, who started out SUM with a very humble, modest, soup kitchen, um, and it's, some has grown over the decades. We're, we're in our 50th anniversary year from a couple soup kitchens started by Father McKenna to this comprehensive human services organization that I described. And Father John Adams, who is that? <laughs> so he's the man. Uh, he is the man behind the brand and the mission of some. So Father John, joined some in 1978 when it was still essentially a couple soup kitchens that were uh, struggling to survive. And he, through inspiration, through faith, through surrounding himself increasingly with tremendous talent and uh, folks with a lot of operational acumen, if you will, um, embracing stakeholders, partners, um, has built this organization over the course of the last four and a half decades from a couple soup kitchens to, as I said, nine serious service lines that are, that are each of which is a real line of business, a real line of service. How many meals do you serve a day to people who are homeless or otherwise in need of meals? Right, so in a non-pandemic context, we serve about 1,200 meals a day. During the COVID-19 crisis, we're serving about 500 meals a day but also maintaining our food distribution networks through our pantries um, and also ready to 
uh, re-gear uh, and, and, and scale up again once um, we can open our dining facility fully again. Now what we have are meals to go for those who need it. So the people that need your meals, where, where are they getting food from if you're not serving them? You give them packaged meals? Yes, so we give them uh, breakfast and lunch on the go, if you will. We have our facility set up so, uh, so people can have essentially what would be window service uh, and they take the meals and then they take them uh, off premises. The folks who are, who are not, the delta between the 1,200 we usually serve and the 500 meals a day we are serving now, that's attributable largely to uh, shelters that are now serving meals and keeping people on site. Um, and so that's where the difference between the 1,200 normally and the 500 we're now uh, doing a day. Uh, how, many people, how many people at night are sleeping in your shelters? So uh, David, we don't run shelters. What we have is a significant and meaningful affordable housing portfolio. So we actually have about 1,130 units in our affordable housing portfolio the significant preponderance of those are actually online and in operation. So housing families, housing individuals, housing children with comprehensive wraparound services, the kind of services that I, talk, that I talked about. And then the remainder is in our development pipeline. We have a pretty robust uh, development pipeline, including uh, that we're, we're now beginning to develop 41 units of, se of senior housing at the former uh, Walter Reed uh, Army Hospital site. Oh, I know you don't service everybody, but in your estimate, how many homeless people are there in the Washington, D.C. area? So the data recently uh, came out just this week uh, that indicates that, are, that there are about 6,500 homeless people in the district itself in about 10,000 uh, homeless across the entire uh, national capital region. Um, that's a significant number, but we would say that it also materially kind of undercounts um, uh, what, what the real, pro the scope of the real problem. Uh, 6,500 is the actual number of people who are either living on the streets or living in shelters, but it doesn't count the, the multiple more of people who are actually on the precipice of homelessness, who are actually at risk of being homeless, and many of whom will be homeless at some point within the next 18 months to two years. In your view, the uh, reason people are homeless, is it lack of job skills, medical problems, addiction, family challenges, mental illness, discrimination? What would you say are the main reasons? So all of the above, David, all that you said are elements of that issue. But the biggest problem that we have here in the national capital region, and it's, and it's a problem that's replicated in many of our major urban centers across the country, especially our large coastal cities, is the lack of affordable housing stock. So to give you some sense of what it takes for someone to live in the district and uh, in market rate housing, someone who's earning the minimum wage would have to work approximately 91 hours a week in order to be able to afford market rate housing. So it's the compression of affordable housing stock that is really driving the issue of homelessness here and in many of our other uh, major cities. So where are you getting your money from? Does it all come from the federal government, from donors? I recognize that one of my partners, Bill Conway, is I assume one of your biggest donors in the building behind you is named after him. Is that right? Uh, that's exactly right. In fact, Bill is the, embodies our notion of time, time, treasure, and talent. He gives all of that to us. But to answer your question quite directly, the preponderance of our budget annually comes from contributions, from donations, from social investors, from individuals to foundations, uh, to corporate social investors. Um, and then the remainder of our budget is made up through a variety of government uh, funding, subsidies, reimbursements, and in some instances, insurance reimbursement, particularly in the, the medical and dental and mental health care space. So the racial composition of those that you serve, what would you say it is? 
It's overwhelmingly black and brown, uh, probably about 99% or north of 99%. So uh, that, that's the, the principal population that we serve. But I wanna underscore, our mission is to serve those who are most vulnerable and most in need. So although the composition of our residents and clients and constituents today is overwhelmingly black and brown, it's not exclusively so. And our services are available to anyone who fits that need profile, that zero to 30% that I, that I described. And with respect to our food services and our emergency services, we ask no question. Anyone who shows up, we serve them. So um, I was at a Thanksgiving event uh, to serve food at, uh, for some, and you know, my services probably weren't thought to be that great because they didn't think I was really giving out the food that well. But how many people do you have volunteering and are you looking for more volunteers? So, yeah, and thank you for your service. Um, I think you, you understate the value of uh, your contribution. Uh, but we, David, we have about 8,000 volunteers doing everything from serving food to tutoring young people in our, in our uh, academic programs, our academic enrichment programs, and also doing things like counseling uh, folks who are in our job training programs on the interview process uh, for getting jobs after they successfully uh, complete our job training program. So if people have an interest and they have time and talent to give us, we'll figure out how to deploy them uh, in a way that, uh, that engages them effectively and, and creates some real impact from, for, the, for the people that we serve. Most people say they don't have time but they have plenty of money. Where can they give you the money? So they can go to our website at www.sumsum.org uh, and make a, a, a financial investment in, in us and our mission and the people we serve. And I would just say, David, uh, during the, this time of what I call our twin crises of COVID-19 and of uh, uh, the concerns that we have about racial justice and inequity, a lot of people, a lot of Americans, some for the first time, but, but not all for the first time, are having this moment of, of introspection, of, of, of self-reflection and wondering, what is it that I can do? What can we do to actually materially help in this context? And the great answer to that is the people that we serve and how we serve them and seeking to empower them to going from insufficiency to prosperity is one of the answers to that question of, of what can I do? Is there a minimum somebody can give and is there a maximum somebody can give? There, there are neither. We have donations that run the gamut from $5 uh, to millions of dollars, thankfully, uh, thanks to the effectiveness of what we do and the range of what we do and people's understanding and appreciation of it. But some of the most inspiring commentary around uh, people who invest in us sometimes come from the people who are giving us $25, which for them is meaningful and material and, and meaningful and material to us as well. So uh, after you graduated from Harvard Law School, you practiced law at a very prominent firm in Boston, as I mentioned, and presumably you could always go back and practice law and make a lot more money than I presume you're making now. I assume you're not doing what you're doing for money-making purposes. So what is it that drove you to do this job as opposed to going back and making a fair amount of money? Uh, so I've been blessed to have made some money already in my life. Um, but for most of my life, I have sought sometimes uh, I've been better at it than at other times to integrate uh, faith in all aspects of my life, from my personal life to my civic life to my professional life. Some is an incredible opportunity for me to take an organization that, frankly, if you were trying to build an organization from scratch today, it would almost be, it wouldn't be impossible, but be near impossible to build an organization that provides the range of services for the most vulnerable people. So the opportunity to put all those skills that I've accumulated over decades um, being a lawyer, being a business person, a banker, a diplomat, all those things, to marshal all those skills to uh, deploy them against this mission um, is really, frankly, the kind of the capstone of, 
of my career, if you will. So to keep what Father John and others have built, um, to keep that mission robustly pursued uh, is really a, a privilege, a profound challenge, daunting in some ways, but one that I embrace fully. Ralph, thank you very much for that description and thank you for coming on today and uh, we wish you the best in your new position. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for allowing me to join this really uh, august group this morning. Thank you.